All right, now this idea of the brain atrophying over time is an important idea. And for the last part of my talk, I want to talk to you about using this idea to help us understand atrophy in our patients with traumatic brain injury. And we use something, uh, and basically this idea of measuring an, an MRI early in time and comparing it to the patient's own MRI later in time is called the longitudinal design. It has to do with change over time compared to the patient's own earlier baseline. And uh, I recently wrote a paper on the longitudinal design in patients with traumatic brain injury, a literature review, which was published last year in the journal Brain Injury. And I looked at all the papers I could find on patients with traumatic brain injury who had MRIs done at more than one point in time. Uh, and I compared the longitudinal design versus the old-fashioned cross-sectional design. The cross-sectional design is just measuring one point in time and trying to determine if a patient has signs of brain atrophy, which would mean uh, abnormally small brain. And to explain this in a, in a more simple, intuitive way for you, imagine that a patient comes to my office and says, Dr. Ross, I think I'm shrinking. I don't know what it is. And I measure his height. And I say, Mr. Jones, don't worry. You're five feet eight inches tall. That's normal height for an adult man. You're well within the normal range. And he says, but Dr. Ross, one year ago, I was six feet two inches tall. And then I would say, oh my goodness, you've shrunk six inches in one year. That's a completely different story. You must have some strange disease going on. Next. So that's the power of the longitudinal design, because you're comparing the patient to his own baseline. Thanks. And we thought that that would be a more powerful design for detecting brain atrophy in our patients did this review and I was able to find 10 studies in the literature and they covered the gamut from mild to severe TBI. The mean time between the injury and the patient's first MRI was two and a half months and the mean time between the first and second MRI was 13.2 months. Now basically these studies found a consistent pattern of brain atrophy. Probably the most commonly used measure was total brain parenchyma. Parenchyma means brain tissue as uh, contrasted with the ventricle, ventricles uh, or cerebrospinal fluid spaces. So total brain parenchymal tissue uh, was consistently found to be smaller in these studies and to get smaller over time, uh, as well as gray matter and white matter regions and hippocampi all found to uh, get to atrophy over time. This review also showed that atrophy correlated with important clinical variables. Because, you know, sometimes I'll tell people the brain atrophies over time in our patients. And they'll ask me, well, you know, that sounds bad, but is it really bad? I mean, couldn't atrophy just sort of be a, a response to injury, a normal healing process, uh, maybe like a, I don't know, a, a, a scar forming where your, the tissue shrinks a little bit? Well, these data show that not only does it sound bad when your brain atrophies, but it is bad because atrophy correlates with important clinical variables. Specifically, the more your brain shrinks over time, the longer you had loss of consciousness at the time of the injury, the longer you had coma at the time of the injury, the longer you had trouble remembering things after your injury, um, the less blood perfusion you had on functional brain imaging technique called SPECT scanning. And finally, uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, at least for uh, our patients' everyday lives, the more your brain shrunk, the worse your functional status, measured by a couple common uh, vocational and functional outcome scales. In other words, the more your brain shrinks, the less chance that you're going to return to work or to be able to stay at work. Now to get into a little bit of the statistical issues, but this is very important, so I want to tell you about this. This literature review found uh, that what we thought was true, yes, the longitudinal design is more powerful than the cross-sectional, that is one point in time design. In fact, it's much more powerful. If you look at statistical effect sizes, you'll see that. And here's a chart of that. Using um, 
studies which looked at whole brain parenchymal volume, and that, those are the most common, uh, that was the region most commonly measured in these studies. We had six studies. The effect size for cross-sectional analysis was 0.6. That's a moderate effect size. That means, yes, patients' brains were smaller than controls. And how big was the effect? Well, it was moderate. Um, but if you look at the longitudinal analyses, the effect size was 1.8. 1.8 is a humongous effect size. To put it on the scale of things, and I showed you this graph, uh, and I explained this below the graph, medium effect size is usually about 0.5, large would be about 0.7. So an effect size of 1.8 is more than twice as big as large. It's really a huge effect size for the kind of studies we usually see in human subjects. Hippocampal volume, we only had a couple studies, but they showed the same pattern here. Effect size moderate for the cross-sectional one-point time design, and a huge effect size of 1.9 for uh, the longitudinal design. So the conclusion of this literature review was as follows. All the studies using the longitudinal design found progressive atrophy in patients with traumatic brain injury. Greater rates of atrophy correlated with decreased ability to return to work and the longitudinal design was much more powerful for the cross-sectional design for detecting progressive atrophy in patients with traumatic brain injury. Well, we wanted to look at a longitudinally designed study in our own patients, and we did this here at the Virginia Institute of Neuropsychiatry. Recently submitted this, and this actually is, uh, has been accepted for publication in brain injury. It should come out this year in 2012. And we um, studied 16 patients, all of whom had mild traumatic brain injury. All of these patients had persistent neuropsychiatric symptoms um, for months, sometimes for years. So these mild traumatic brain injuries probably are not typical mild traumatic brain injury patients because most patients with mild traumatic brain injury will clear up uh, and the symptoms will go away and it, in a matter of minutes to days to weeks, but there are about 10 to 15 percent of traumatic brain injury patients with mild TBI and the symptoms don't come up, don't clear up. They can have symptoms for months and years without clearing up. Those are the kind of patients that come to our clinic and although they are the minority of patients with mild traumatic brain injury, it's still a lot of patients we're talking about and we're talking about a really bad set of problems in these patients. So this is an important group to study. And we did an MRI scan at two points in time, about a year apart on each of these patients, and that is the longitudinal design. Uh, and as part of this study, we did uh, some test retest reliability. And this is a basic, uh, important step of any sort of scientific method or study to check your reliability. Reliability basically means repeatability. So if you're measuring something, if you measure it once, and then you measure it again a little bit later, in test retest reliability, do you get the same results? Because you ought to get the same results. Uh, ideally, you'd get exactly the same results. In practice, you may not get exactly the same, but you want to get almost, almost the same. So you find out how good is that reliability. And we had data uh, in our normal control group at one year apart. Ideally, we would want to test retest reliability to have two MRIs more like an hour apart or a day apart. We didn't happen to have that data available. We had it a year apart. A lot of things can happen in a year. So that's a limitation. But if our reliability was low over a year, we wouldn't be sure if it was due to the technique of Neuroquant or if it was due to the fact that one year is longer time than you really wanted. But if our reliability was good over a year, then we could be confident that yes, Neuroquant is a, a reliable technique. So we went ahead and checked the reliability of multiple brain regions that Neuroquant analyses uh, gave us. And we found that the reliabilities were um, excellent to outstanding for the large majority of these regions. Looking at them from top to bottom, uh, anything above uh, 0 0.90 is excellent to outstanding. The putamen and third ventricle were good. Paladin was, was good, fair to good. Ventral diencephalon at the very bottom, not that great fair to poor, so we would not want to use that in our further analysis. But the other regions would be reasonable to use for scientific or clinical studies.
So, having checked a little bit of the basic scientific method uh, with what we were doing, we got back to doing our longitudinal study here. And we focused on several brain regions in the first column when we looked at this group of 16 patients and compared them to our 20 normal controls to see how the brain regions changed over about a year period on average. And we found that several brain regions did uh, atrophy significantly in our patients. Whole brain parenchyma, which is all the tissue in the brain, uh, atrophied significantly uh, with a p-value of 0.003, which is highly statistically significant. That means it's very unlikely to be due to chance alone. And the effect size associated with that was 1.5. Um, in this case, effect size is, is how much did the brain shrink in patients versus how much it shrank in controls. Again, 1.5 is a very large effect size. So our brain, patients' brains are shrinking much faster than would be normal. Uh, when you have large effect sizes, that in science and medicine tends to mean this is something important, something you should really pay attention to. Forebrain parenchyma, which uh, NeuroQuant defines as all of the brain except the brainstem and cerebellum, that also atrophied significantly over time with a very large effect size. Not too surprising because the forebrain parenchyma correlates strongly with whole brain parenchyma since it constitutes maybe 70% of whole brain parenchyma. Cerebral white matter also atrophied significantly with a very large effect size. Interesting because we know that traumatic brain injury uh, involves diffuse axonal injury. Remember, the gray matter on the surface of the brain is composed mostly of neuronal cell bodies. Uh, the neurons, uh, a single neuron has a neuronal cell body which is like a little computer and then a long axon which is like a cable that connects it to other neurons. And those long axons when grouped together form the white matter of the brain. And they go from the cortical surface down through the brain down to through the brain stem and spinal cord and the white matter also connects different regions of the brain. Because these axons or white matter are long and thin, when you have a traumatic brain injury, they tend to get twisted or torn, injured, uh, or they can die off. And so it was interesting to us that the white matter um, was significantly affected in our patients, and, I, and that's what we would have hypothesized. Cerebellum also atrophied significantly with a very large effect size. Okay, now in this slide, we're looking at the correlation between the rate of brain atrophy in our patients and functional or vocational outcome measured with the GOSE, which is the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended Version, which is a very good, reliable, and valid method for measuring functional outcome in our patients with traumatic brain injury. And we found several significant correlations, um, and basically, the more the brain atrophied, the less likely our patients were able to return to work. Um, similarly, the more the cerebral spinal fluid spaces enlarged, which are mostly consist of ventricles, the less likely someone was able to work. 